Hi, and uh, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're watching this particular broadcast of the T20 World Cup. And this is your Master Analyzer uh, series of episodes. Thanks for joining us and also thanks to our sponsors and PNG Cricket for bringing this to you. I'm John Buchanan. I'll be your Master Analyzer and host through the series. We're also joined by allatcricket.com's Krishna Tunga, who will be providing the master statistics and data that we'll be using throughout the series. So let's get to our first game. First game of the T20 World Cup was Papua New Guinea versus Oman. To do so, I'm going to uh, go to Crick Info and look at their uh, screen to give us a very, very quick summary of the game. And as we go through the game, I will also talk about our comms, which we see as our change of momentum moments that were significant contributions to the end result of the game. So firstly, we see that Oman won the toss and elected to field. And I think this is a pretty important uh, decision, given that it's being played in Oman, that we need to maybe track through these early qualifying rounds. Oman exploited it very well, but of course, in the second game, Bangladesh attempted to do the same thing against Scotland, but came undone. But nonetheless, I think it's worthwhile noting that Oman won the toss and elected to field. So firstly, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea batting. And here's our first change of momentum moment where both openers were gone inside the first two openers without any runs being posted on the board. So within the power play and within the first two overs, Papua New Guinea were chasing the game. So we then had a, a very significant partnership from Asad Vala and Charles Amini. They were able to get the score to two for 70 at the drinks break at the 10 over mark and were really beginning to just accelerate the game. But here was our next change of momentum moments coming in the 12th over where an attempted run uh, by Charles Amini saw him having to turn around and Mohammed Nadim threw the wickets down to run him out at a very vital stage. And as I say, in the 12th over, that was a real turning point because those two batsmen have put together a record partnership of 81 for the third wicket and were really starting to dominate the Oman attack. And unfortunately, soon after, in the 13th over, or the 14th over, I should say, um, Asad Vala, attempting to loft um, Kelly Muller was unfortunately uh, caught at uh, deep mid on. And so those two batsmen who were in and going were now back in the dressing rooms and we had new players in. That was again, another change of a meta moment that really was beginning to tip the game towards Oman, but it further tipped their, their way when Zishan Maksud, their captain, in the 16th over, took three wickets. And really, that took um, uh, Papua New Guinea from a position where, as you see, in the fall of wickets, they were four for 102 in the 15th over. And in that 16th over, they then fell to uh, seven for 113. So really, um, it was just poor partnership batting at that point in time, poor shot selection um, by the Papua New Guinea batsmen. Um, and Oman were really tightening the screws to have Papua New Guinea all out for, oh, sorry, nine for 129 at the end of the 20 overs. So, of course, what that means is with a, a, a lowish score, and of course, probably not sure exactly what the score uh, is till the team bat second, but it looked at a lowish score. So that meant that Papua New Guinea bowlers needed to really start very well. They needed to make sure that the Oman batsmen were taking risks, uh, high risks, to, to begin to score runs. However, unfortunately, that was not to be the case because our first, our opening bowlers in Damien Ravu and Nosana Pokana were unable to maintain any sort of consistency of line or length. So they either bowled short, which uh, Jatinder Singh and uh, Aki Ilyas uh, were able to find the boundaries, or then they bowled too full and wide and, and a similar occurrence. 
Uh, even when they brought on Kabua Moria, same thing happened. So really, at the power play, at the end of the power play, Oman were already none for 46. They accelerated that to the 10 over mark to be none for 88. And in the end, finished off the innings, as you see, um, in the 14th over, none down for 131. So quite a comprehensive win uh, for Oman. Um, from this point, though, uh, one of the things that we are doing through uh, each game of the series is that we are inviting the viewers to enter in questions or observations that they would like the master analyzer to provide some insights to or some um, uh, guides to future games that, uh, in this case, Papua New Guinea are playing. So, uh, advertises basically what this is and then our announces our first winner uh, from this game. And here is the, uh, the prize. We have uh, a gift voucher from Echo Look and Echo Loom, $50 gift voucher. We have a signed uh, T-shirt from myself uh, for the winner of each game. And that will simply by submitting your uh, question at reach us at adsguru.com.au. Hi, John. Just a quick question. What would be PNG's uh, strategy to um, participate in this uh, upcoming T20? So if we first looked at their batting in this particular game, which we have already done so, <clears throat> it's interesting that in the 29 T20 games that Papua New Guinea have played, they have been involved in 10 batting collapses already. And as you see there, we define a batting collapse as um, wickets falling within 10 runs of each other, three or more wickets falling within 10 runs of, runs of each other, and we would consider that to be a batting collapse. So in Papua New Guinea's innings, we know that they lost two wickets very early, but then their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth wicket partnerships all fell within 10 runs of each other. So that really did constitute a significant batting collapse for them. Um, we also uh, wanted to note, though, beyond the collapse, there is some very uh, encouraging signs for Papua New Guinea batting, certainly from Captain Asad Vala, um, who was dismissed in the 14th over for 56. This is his ninth score of 25-plus and third consecutive 25-plus um, uh, runs in an innings. Charles Amini, likewise, uh, scored a very good 37 from 26 balls, and he now has eight scores of 25 plus, and his second consecutive 25 plus uh, innings. Uh, so they're, they're good signs, but obviously it needs to be backed up by other batsmen as well. And what I did notice was as Papua New Guinea were playing, they really favoured the onside. They were trying to tug the ball to the leg side quite often probably seeking the shorter boundary. So here is um, some answers for Alfred in terms of the batting. Firstly, Papua New Guinea throughout their innings need to be able to structure some partnerships of 20 plus runs. Particularly in the power play, it would be ideal that they could get to the end of the power play having scored 45 or more runs with the loss of no wickets or only one wicket. Uh, as we've said, batsmen like Asad Vala and Charles Amini need to be showing consistency, which is scoring 25 or more, but doing it uh, consecutively. So that, therefore, that will lead then to partnerships. And certainly, if we have a batsman in, as Vala or uh, Amini were, one of them needs to be able to continue through the innings to get to the 18th, 19th or 20th over. And at which stage, that will help not only establish some partnerships, but also should it help establish a decent total. And I think the biggest thing technically for the uh, Papua New Guinea batsmen is just to straighten their game up at the moment. So in other words, start to try to hit more the mid-on, mid-off, straight, uh, extra cover regions rather than try to tug the ball all the way across to the, the onside, albeit that it might be the shorter boundary. So that's from a batting perspective. If we looked at the bowling strategies, um, there is no doubt that the PNG bowlers felt that their score was uh, inadequate and so they strove to 
make amends for that uh, as quickly as I possibly could. Uh, however, um, it uh, probably worked against them that their lines, their lengths uh, were quite wayward in those power play overs, which allowed uh, the two unknown batsmen, Ilyas and Singh, to really establish a, a good partnership and then were able to continue uh, to develop that partnership right through to the end. So some strategies for the bowlers. They would have had their game plans pretty clear, um, but however, it was the scoreboard that was dictating the way that they were uh, bowling. And, and so one is uh, take the emotion out of the game and play in your skill, and that should allow the quicker bowlers then to bowl top of off, providing little width to the batsman. And from the spinner's point of view, um, as we looked at the Oman bowlers, uh, trying to skid the ball where they can and then vary their pace, forcing the batsman to make all the pace on the ball. A couple of final comments that uh, I would make for uh, Papua New Guinea going forward. And that is, this is the first time that the Papua New Guinea team have lost all 10 wickets in a game. So as a coach, I'd be quite tolerant here and put it down to a little bit of stage fright, a little bit of emotion getting the better of uh, the team. And it was their first game on the big stage. So we might be able to suggest that uh, those emotions will be well kept in check uh, second game around, and that will be against Scotland. I think, as I've already said, it's worth noting about the toss. Oman have a high success rate in terms of uh, winning games. And I'll, I'll mention that very briefly shortly. Uh, from winning the toss and then sending their opposition into bat. And as I said, while Bangladesh came unstuck uh, doing the same in the second game of the evening, it really was due to some late order, uh, good hitting and partnership batting from, uh, from Chris Greaves and Mark Watt, uh, plus some very, very poor shot selection from the Bangladesh batsmen in terms of chasing down the total. So as you see, uh, here's an interesting statistic. Um, when bowling first, this is the 11th time a man have kept their uh, opposition under 130, winning every game. So that means having bowled first now, uh, whenever they bowl first, they're winning 60% of their games. The last uh, comments, hopefully of interest, um, this is the second time a man have won a T20 game by 10 wickets, successfully chasing without losing a wicket. Um, and the top five teams to do so, Oman now have two chases in that top five. You'll see there New Zealand, England, South Africa, and now Oman join them twice with winning by 10 wickets when chasing totals. So that brings us to the conclusion of this master analyzer. I hope that has answered some questions that you might have from the first game. Uh, should you have more questions of following games, as we said, reach out uh, uh, or reach us um, is going to be the link for you to send those questions or observations in. You stand a chance to win uh, a prize for submitting the best question. Um, the next game we'll be covering will be Papua New Guinea versus Scotland on the 19th. So we look forward to your company then. Bye for now.